Good morning and welcome to the Oasis Global Gathering. And for those of you who have not had the opportunity of joining us before, we're especially glad that you've chosen to spend this time with us. My name's Steve Chalk and I'm the founder of Oasis and one of the ministers of Oasis Church Waterloo in London. And this morning it's my happy task to guide you through what's coming up on the Oasis Global Gathering over the next 30 minutes or so. In a few minutes, we're going to be meeting an old friend of mine in our weekly Connect slot, while later we'll be continuing with the theme of our gatherings for the last few weeks, Building Christ-Centred Communities, where we're digging into some of the core lessons that we can learn from the very first Christian communities, the ones that we read about in the Bible. This week, the age-old problem of handling conflict and how to stay united despite internal disagreements. Now, besides a small but growing number of church communities, Oasis is responsible for 53 schools and about 31 and a half thousand children around the country. And of course, on top of that, we also work with many more children and young people, not only through the work of our churches, but also our hospital, A&E and custody centre teams and in lots of other settings as well. Way back last summer, a study by the NHS found that a staggering one in six children were suffering with their mental health. However, it's also certain that since then, that number has continued to escalate. The only thing we can't be sure of is the long-term impact of all this. So, as part of what Oasis is doing to tackle this issue, we've put together what we're calling Body and Soul. A few days ago, I got together with Jim Currell, who's part of Oasis, Mr. Motivator, and Kate, Motivator's executive assistant. Our task to finalise some of the last minute details for our long planned big day, Friday, May the 14th. Oasis has teamed up with Mr. Motivator, an old friend of mine from TV days, as well as two fantastic charities the Children's Society and Applause for Thought, which is a new charity working to support young people in the acting profession, which has been hit especially hard by the pandemic. We've been working to create a special fitness routine that will lift us all mentally and physically and at the same time raise funds for young people's mental health. It's called Body and Soul. Body and soul is so important because, first of all, I have the body and Steve has the soul. But the underlying message is, is that every single one of us not only need to be physically fit, but we need to be mentally fit and prepared for the future. So take part now. Say yeah. As we move out of a year of COVID restrictions, we all want to get motivated physically and emotionally. Children and young people especially have had a tough time with missed education and isolation from friends. We're excited that huge numbers of schools across the country are booking to be part of our world record attempt for the largest number of people simultaneously taking part in the same easy to do fun workout. Body and Soul combines easy dance moves that anyone from 5 to 85 can join in. It's a fun fitness routine set to a Caribbean style music mix and it will also help raise funds, much needed funds, for young people's mental health. From Monday the 10th of May to Thursday the 13th, you can have fun learning our eight minute routine at a time that suits you. Then, on Friday the 14th, join me, Mr. Motivator, and tens of thousands of children and adults at 9.30am in one simultaneous, countrywide record attempt. 
So why not motivate your body and soul with our physical and emotional fitness workout and give what you can as you do? You can access the training videos to learn the routine and to get lots more information all online at www.bodyandsoul.org.uk. And why don't we all give it a go? Have a little practice right now. As you'll discover, the beauty of Body and Soul is that you can either do our workout sat comfortably on the chair you're enjoying right now or up on your feet. A little bit like this. Body and Soul coming to you in May. Oh my goodness, it's going to be a party. You know, it's fitness for all. Everybody can do it, no matter how young, no matter how old. It's important that everybody get up and get ready. Guess what? You can do it from a chair. You can do it standing up. Oh my goodness, it's going to be so good for you. It's going to emotionally make you feel good. It's going to... Huh, huh, it's going to make you jump up and be happy. Here we go. We're going to do all kinds of moves. From shooting the basket. Here we go, like so. Push it up and down. Uh oh, guess what we're gonna do? We're gonna drive the car. Come on now. Ho, ho, come on. You can do it. And we go in shopping. Push that trolley. Reverse that trolley. Forward that trolley and back. Here we go, here we go. We're gonna spy on the neighbors. Uh huh. Here we go, let's go, let's go. So much coming to you, body and soul. Every single child, every single family needs to be involved. So get up and get your body ready. Ha! Here we go. Here we go, here we go. Motivator, we're out of here. See ya. Ha! And relax. You see, it's easy. So remember to go to www.bodyandsoul.org.uk to find out more about how you can be part of our world record attempt. Now for something completely different, as they say. This week, as part of our series, Building Christ-Centered Communities, Rebecca Gibson, who's the Advice Center Manager at Oasis Waterloo, is going to take a look at the age-old problem of how to handle conflict. How do we stay united when there isn't uniformity? And just before she does that, our Bible reading comes from Sarah Reynolds, part of Oasis Church Bath, reading from Acts chapter 4 and then from chapter 15. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of his possessions was his own, but they shared everything they had. Sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us go back and visit the brothers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord, and see how they are doing. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them. But Paul did not think it wise to take him, because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and left, commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. He went through Syria and Cilicia strengthening the churches. Good morning. Today we're going to be unpacking a bit about some conflicts that arose within the early church and what we might be able to learn from this about how to handle conflict in our own communities today. Personally, this is very much a learning journey for me and I am by no means an expert in conflict resolution. What I'm going to say isn't designed to be prescriptive, but to explore some ideas together 
and you can read more about lots of different conflict resolution theories and ideas with a quick Google, should you wish. A couple of other disclaimers before I get any further. The suggestions I'm going to make about how we might want to approach conflict are for situations where, although there may be some personal hurt surrounding a conflict, the conflict is not one that is actively causing harm to another person or where there is an imbalance of power. In those situations, it may not be possible or healthy to seek the kind of resolutions I'm talking about. And in situations of abuse, escalation and external intervention will be required and should be encouraged. But with all that in mind, let's turn to our reading from the early church. If you're watching the Global Gathering a few weeks ago, you might remember we read the passage from Acts chapter 4 then. Nathan spoke of the generosity of the early church, how all the believers worked together to ensure no one had need. As Acts 4 says, they were one in heart and mind. So how did the believers go from being of one mind to Paul and Barnabas parting ways after a round? Well, let's skip forward a bit further on the journey from Acts chapter 4. And we see Paul and Barnabas, two apostles, developing and flourishing together as they share the good news and build church communities. Paul has gone on a credible journey of transformation from extremist persecutor of the church to great evangelist. And Barnabas is described in Acts as a good man, someone who sold his land for the good of the church. And he also vouches for Paul's integrity shortly after Paul's conversion, when the community was still a bit suspicious of him and his motivations. So together, Paul and Barnabas are here working as a team throughout the book of Acts. So far, so good. Until we hit Acts 15 and a sharp disagreement over the trustworthiness of another travelling companion, John Mark, seemingly sends Paul and Barnabas to part ways in a bit of a strop at each other. And from that point on, it's never mentioned that they work together again. Although there are some suggestions that Paul at least still had great respect for Barnabas in one of Paul's later letters. We'll have to speculate slightly, but I think ultimately what happened here is that Paul and Barnabas were human. They were two flawed people who had a fight and they picked different sides. I appreciate the honesty here and that the Bible doesn't just gloss over this. And sometimes I think a resolution like this in a situation of conflict is okay. In some situations, reconciliation may not be reached and relationships may end. And it seems that Paul and Barnabas were able to carry on their mission of spreading the good news with their new travelling companions. However, I also wonder if there are things we could learn to try and approach conflict so that we don't always have to part ways when we have a disagreement or an argument. I think our intent and our posture towards conflict is important here. Our goal as church community should be to seek a collective wholeness, which benefits the whole community as well as individuals. And this wholeness isn't going to come if we suppress or dodge conflict when it inevitably appears. In any church, any community, any interpersonal relationship, any workplace, conflict is going to occur whether about strategic direction, areas of theological importance, or whose turn it is to put away the chairs. And I think many of us have strong reactions when faced with conflict. Some of us may ignore conflict, squash it and hope it goes away. What normally happens in these situations is a sense of anger and resentment builds up. Eventually it normally explodes in some unhealthy way, causing unnecessary hurt to someone. Equally, some of us might launch ourselves into conflict, seek it out and even thrive off it, wanting to get straight to the root of something, not afraid to address the situation head on. This can be useful, especially in addressing situations of injustice, but it can also sometimes lead to unnecessary arguments, tension or division. I think it's more helpful to see conflict in a neutral way, intrinsically neither good or bad, but something that can be wielded for personal gain and division, or as something to navigate 
on the journey to community wholeness. So how might we approach situations of conflict? I think actually the Oasis ethos can be a useful tool to us here, a lens through which to approach conflict resolution within the church. I wasn't personally involved in the shaping of the Oasis ethos, so I hope those who were won't mind me appropriating them for this. Obviously, living out the Oasis ethos stretches beyond just conflict resolution, but I think they might be helpful in thinking about how we might go about resolving and transforming our ideas about conflict. Our values, if you don't know, are a passion to include everyone, a desire to treat everyone equally, respecting differences, a commitment to healthy, open relationships, a deep sense of hope that things can change and be transformed, and a sense of perseverance to keep us going for the long haul. I want to draw on a couple of these that I think can particularly help us. Our desire to treat everyone equally, respecting differences. We want everyone in our communities to know a deep sense of belonging and wholeness. And this leads us to put the work in to ensuring our communities are inclusive and differences are not ignored or crushed. However, it's fair to say difference can often lead to conflict. Most areas of our lives tend to be echo chambers, but church can provide an opportunity to be in community with people different to us. We're drawn to each other by a mutual love of God and our neighbour. But beyond that, we may not have many similarities. This can lead to division as we counter, encounter people who think differently to us or have different experiences. But I think when we can lean into difference and learn to respect them, we will have deeper relationships. One of my former lecturers from uh, Oasis College, Jeremy Thompson, uh, writes in a book about conflict and difference, saying this. To sacrifice my particular personality is to be untrue to the way God made me, while to negate your personality is a refusal to acknowledge the way God made you. Somehow, you and I must negotiate and find a mutually respecting solution. In this process, we generate trust, awareness, hope, we may make mistakes and learn to recover from them. In the process of relating to others, we discover more of who we ourselves are. So our commitment to healthy, open relationships. If we're able to include and to respect difference, we're able to have dialogue and disagreement within the mutual trust of a healthy relationship to work through conflict in a way that will enable us to flourish. In practice, I think this can look like a few things. Genuinely listening to the other person or people and their perspective. Being willing to let go of the need to be right whilst maintaining our integrity. And an ability to address conflict directly, knowing you're in a safe space not gossiping or allowing things to simmer, but approaching a person, group or situation directly, knowing you have each other's flourishing as your primary goal. And knowing when we might need to involve others, we may not be able to resolve conflict on our own and we should feel able within a healthy relationship to involve a mediator or a small group to try and support us with the challenge or difference in front of us. Or maybe if we're struggling to create a healthy relationship and want to get there. We know that resolution is not always easy and that respect of difference, healthy relationships and ability to handle conflict do not develop overnight. But as we navigate how we relate to others, we know we will uncover more of our true selves and we'll work towards creating healthy, thriving communities of wholeness. So, my hope and prayer for us all is that we'll take these values into our lives, our struggles, our wrestles with conflict, and that we may begin to be transformed. May we be of one heart and mind, as the early church was in its moments of thriving. Thank you, Rebecca.
So now let's take just a few moments to reflect again on what Rebecca has just said. In any church, any community, any interpersonal relationship, any workplace, conflict is going to occur. And for all sorts of reasons. Some of us, she said, may try to ignore a conflict, to squash it, close our eyes to it and hope that it goes away. While normally what happens in these situations is that a sense of anger and resentment builds up, often exploding in some unhealthy way, causing unnecessary hurt. Others of us are prone to launch ourselves into conflict and even thrive through it. This can sometimes be useful, but it often also leads to unnecessary arguments, to tension, to division, and to lots of pain. As Rebecca spoke, what resonated with you about her message? How can you better navigate conflict? Let me lead you in this famous prayer. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there's hatred, let me bring love. Where there's offence, let me bring pardon. Where there's discord, let me bring union. Where there is error, let me bring truth. Where there's doubt, let me bring faith. Where there's despair, let me bring hope. Where there is darkness, let me bring your light. Where there is sadness, let me bring joy. Master, let me not seek as much to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it's in giving that one receives, it's in self-forgetting that one finds. It's in pardoning that one is pardoned. It's in dying that one is raised to eternal life. Amen. Well, that's just about it for this week. Thank you again for joining us. We're going to leave you with a rendition of a wonderful old hymn which was penned way back in 1878 by Horatio Spafford after a series of huge struggles he faced in his life. It is well with my soul. <laughs>